midst of a series of lessons in which we established from the Scriptures Old Testament prophecies that pointed to an institution, an organism, or an organization, whatever name you want to call it and give it, because of the various characteristics of it, of a body composed of the saved, with Christ as the head, with the view to heaven above, and with the opportunity for the totality of humanity, this side of the cross, being members of that body. It is the body of Christ. It is the one body of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. It is the body that is, in fact, the saved and that will be delivered back to the Father on the last day, that eternal kingdom. We noted as well that while there were specific prophecies made concerning its establishment and its certain establishment in the first century, there was also prophecies made concerning a falling away. A falling away that would be, in many respects, disastrous. Apostasy. Even so much that that which we would describe as the apostate church predicted with specific terms in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 by the Apostle Paul and also in the first epistle to Timothy, which was read for us a few moments ago, in chapter 4. And with the assurance, if you want to use that term, that this apostate church would continue until the Lord's return, at which time it would be destroyed by the power of God. Now, it's always been the case that when we look at Old Testament history, that when you find some New Testament writer saying, for example, in Acts chapter 2, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, then there is no doubt whatsoever but that what Peter is talking about in Acts chapter 2 is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, we don't have that ability today because we do not have an inspired man who can say, now here is just exactly what Peter, what Paul, what James, what John, what Jesus was talking about in regards to this certain apostasy. Well, at the same time, God blessed mankind, all accountable human beings, with the ability to draw conclusions made necessary by the evidence. And it is based upon that evidence that without a shadow of a doubt, we can draw certain conclusions relative to an apostasy with the distinguishing characteristics as described in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 as well as in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meat. Now that's two pretty significant things. There are those in our day, religious groups, who command to abstain from meat. Sit right there and show Bill Miller film strips to one such individual who thinks that it's sinful to eat pork. Why? Because he's still trying to live under various parts of Old Testament law. That's why. But one of the strictures of that religious organization is you can't eat certain meats. Well, Paul said that all meats are good and to be received with thanksgiving by those that believe and know the truth. How can you get around a verse like that? But that institution does not forbid to marry. It doesn't have a separate priesthood that says, oh, it's a higher station in life if you don't ever get married. And so just be married to God, and there will be some women, and they'll be known as being married unto the Lord too, and they won't get married either. And it will be forbidden for them to be married. There's only one organization, one religious institution on the earth today that has been in existence for quite some time and that according to Jesus himself will continue until the Lord returns that has those characteristics. It is the 
papacy. It is Roman Catholicism in its entirety. These individuals have been exposed by our brethren at least five times in the last five years. And with an inability to defend themselves, all they can do, as much of what we'll see here later on today, is to throw themselves on the mercy of what the church, quote-unquote, says. Because when there is a contradiction between what the Bible says and what the Roman Catholic Church says, then throw the Bible away. We'll have to stick with the Roman Catholic Church. And they do that every time. When we realize that there are roughly one billion people who are caught up one way or another in this apostate religion, it should cause us to feel bad. Because when people are lost, we know as the church of the living God, we have the obligation to go into the whole world and preach the gospel to such individuals. But when individuals are raised in this type of setting and with this mentality, it is very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to get them to see the error of their ways and the truth of Almighty God. Maybe, though, with enough information and enough ammunition, if you will, we will be better prepared after this series of lessons to help those individuals at the same time how they better understanding of history as it relates to who we are and where we are in relation to a divided religious world that is around about us. The rise of Catholicism. And then today, we're going to look at why there were certain individuals 500 years ago who said, basically, enough is enough. But the problem was is that they went into the other ditch. They ran from one ditch of Catholicism to another ditch and end up in just as bad a shape as that which they revolted and rebelled against. And that's what we'll be looking at this morning. Remember last Sunday night, we sort of left foundation. Because there have been periods of time down through history, not just biblical history, not just inspired history, but there have been different institutions that have been restored down through history to their original form. And at the same time, there have been those who did not seek to restore to the original model. They just sought to reform to where it is more palatable, which is exactly what many of these individuals were trying to do at the beginning. We know that there were specific commands that were given to this man, Jehu, in regards to straightening up God's people. But we also noted that it, fall, it fell far short of where it needed to be. And sadly, we would have to admit that when people are only partially committed to the Word of God and are committed to other things as well, then it's also going to be a partial return and not a complete return. And that's exactly what we want. This fellow, a bust of his, I mean, that's exactly what he looked like. You see, while they did not have cameras back then, they had people who could color pictures a whole lot better than me. And they had people who were very good with taking concrete and turning it into a face or a whole body. So that these individuals and their likenesses, we know what they look like. Here's Constantine. Constantine called together representatives from all of the provinces under the Roman Empire and he wanted them to get together and quit the bickering that had characterized the church up to that moment in time. And he wanted everybody to be united. Quit arguing. Quit fighting. Let's agree on something. And that's the way it's going to be. And the thing is, he had been able to do that in the Roman Empire, but he didn't do it just by gentle persuasion. He did it with a sword. Now, surely, surely the sword would not enter into what he's trying to do here, would it? Is it possible that he would use the sword to bring about unity in the Roman Empire? Well, on decree of the emperor, these individuals came together to discuss the matters that were before them. 
And when they came together and made decisions and wrought conclusions, those conclusions stood as Roman law. Wait a minute. I thought this was a church. Well, it started off being that. But when the church started taking funds from the government, and when the church started allowing its priests to be influenced by the government, it was that old proverbial, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. You give me what I want and I'll give you what you want. You see, that just didn't happen in this century, folks, nor in the last part of the last century. That's been going on as far as there have been people who were not committed to the right thing. It's called, well, you know what it's called. And it's not a very good thing that it is called. When someone can be paid for services, and they end up doing disservice to the people who are under their watch care. And that's what happened. Here is the Roman emperor's decree. It's no longer the decree of the head of, or heads of the various congregations. It is the decree of the Roman emperor himself. And guess what happens? And that is the way it is. Well, if you don't agree with the emperor, there's ways that we can get you to agree, or you will not have a chance to disagree with anybody ever again. And with an iron fist, things started off. You see, we talked about how this predicted and everything. Don't you know this? By the time of Constantine, already, as we noted in previous lessons, already it had got to the point where God's divine order for the organizational structure of the Lord's church was a thing of the past. Because no longer were individual congregations ruled by their own elders, men who met the qualifications of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, and those elders having the responsibility to see to that individual congregation, that was a thing of the past, except in some obscure cases of which the Bible and secular history is silent. Well, wait a minute. Wasn't that what Paul had said in Acts chapter 20? Of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them? Had not Paul even predicted that it would be from the eldership, from the leadership, that the apostasy would originate? Guess what? It did originate in the leadership. And so now, you've got very little difference between the politicians and the priests. As a matter of, matter of fact, the priests are the politicians, and the politicians are the priests. The structure, you can easily see how it would happen. The bishops of Italy became the heirs of the Roman Senate, and the bishop of Rome became the successor to the emperor. And so there you have that pyramid established in the Roman government, and then you have that pyramid structure in the apostate church, the Roman Catholic Church. And then you've got the monks, not monkeys, but the monks who claim to be ascetics, who withhold from themselves all the needs of the flesh, food, even some wouldn't even take a bath because that would cause them to be soft or something, I reckon. It said concerning one of these monks that when he would stand up, the vermin would run from, out from, up from under his beard. That's pitiful. But that was a dedicated, quote-unquote, Christian. How could people be so deceived into thinking this was anything close to Christianity? Well, one thing is, you do not allow the Word of God to be written in the language of the people. And if nobody can read Latin, and the Bible is written in Latin, then nobody's going to be able to know what the Word of God says. And then you're dependent upon this person who's supposed to be overseeing you and concerned about your spiritual welfare. And since you can't know what the truth is, you're dependent upon him to tell you what the truth is, and he can lie to you and you won't know it. And then you'll have to pay him for lying to you. You know what, folks? The only difference between then and now 
is that people now can read the Bible. People today do have the Bible in their own language, and yet they're still ignorant many times, just as much as they were when they didn't even have a Bible. And thus they're led around with a person pulling them by the nose and taking their money as it goes. Sad indeed. Don't you read? This is a quotation, not written by any of our brethren, but I want you to listen how the situation was when John Calvin, Martin Luther, and some of those other reformers came along. Listen closely to this. In 1509, when John Calvin was born, Western Christendom, and that word Christendom simply means everybody that claims to be a Christian, Roman Catholicism, still shared a common religion of eminence. Heaven was never too far from earth. The sacred was diffused in the profane, the spiritual in the material. Divine power embodied in the Roman church and its sacrament reached down through innumerable points of contact to make itself felt, to forgive or to punish, to protect against the ravages of nature, to heal, to soothe, and to work all sorts of wonders. Priests could absolve adulterers and murderers, or they could bless fields and cattle. Friends, don't they every year have a some kind of priest in, in Chattanooga and everybody takes their pet and their pet is blessed? Now, that, that, that's Christianity, right? It's not something just happened lately. They've been doing it since the time of Luther and Calvin. During their lives, saints could prevent lightning from striking, restore sight to the blind, preach to birds and to fish. Been better off they were. Unencumbered by the limitations of time and space, they could do even more through their images and relics after death. You know what that's called? That's called idolatry. That's called idolatry. A pious glance at a statue of St. Christopher in the morning ensured protection from illness and death throughout the day. And so I guess if somebody died, that means they didn't look at that statue that morning, right? Burial in the habit of St. Francis improved the prospects for the afterlife. Well, don't you know that people would be bidding on a place to be buried so that it might ensure them getting to heaven a whole lot faster? A pilgrimage to Santiago, where the body of the Apostle James had been deposited by the angels, or to Canterbury, could make a lame man walk or hasten a soul's release from purgatory. The map of Europe bristled with holy places, life pulsated with the expectation of the miraculous. In the popular mind and in much of the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, almost anything was possible. One could even eat the flesh of the risen Christ in a consecrated wafer. Last Sunday night, I think I made the statement. Maybe I didn't. I might have. Much of late medieval religion was magical, and the difference between churchmen and magicians lay less in what they claimed they could do than in the authority on which their claims rested. What do you think about that? Here is David Copperfield. Where does he get his authority? Here is a priest. Claims to be able to do everything David Copperfield can do, and then some. Where does he get his authority? This is illustrated by the crucifix that controlled the weather at Calvary. Late medieval piety showed an almost irrepressible urge to localize the divine power, making it tangible and bring it under control. Now, this fellow here came out of Roman Catholicism. And he simply began to write down some of the things that he had been taught, some of the things. Have you ever heard of the waters at Lourdes? Have you ever known of people who tried to get to Europe so they could get close to that water so that they might be healed of some terrible disease? Do you remember when Paul was describing there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he talked about wonders and signs and the word that's used to describe both of them, lying. That's it, folks. 
You tell me what this is. If Roman Catholicism is not what Paul's talking about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, then tell me what is in existence in our world today that has so many similarities to it that it would remove Roman Catholicism from being it. Well, it's not it. There it is. And we just have to... Now you remember. Remember this word that Paul used described in Hymenaeus and Philetus that it was like a canker? It's like a, gran- a gangrene that keeps on spreading if it's not taken care of? What do you think would have happened if when this apostasy started, all the way back almost to the days of the apostles, if people have stood up and said, no, wait a minute. We can't have one elder segmented off over here as if he's the head elder. That's not what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, Peter, when he was describing the fact that he was an elder, he pointed out that he was not going to be one who was lording over anybody. And an elder is not supposed to do that. And that he was an elder over the flock under which he was the one that was the overseer, as well as the rest of the elders in that congregation. So if somebody just stood up and said, where is the Bible for this? And there would have been enough people to stand up and say, where is the Bible for this? Then the gangrene wouldn't have grown to the enormous extent that it has today to have engulfed a sixth of the population of the earth. That's a big cancer, folks. A big cancer. The apostasy grew. Here's all of these councils. And each one of these councils gives rise to people seeing that here is a great divergence that exists between what the Bible teaches and by the decisions that we are making as leaders of the Roman church. Now, what are some of the reasons behind it? Well, there were corrupt practices of Catholicism. Think about it, friends and brethren. Reckon how many priests have avoided being exposed down through the centuries Reckon before there ever became any such thing as television, newspapers, radio. Reckon what goes on today was going on back then? Possible? When people mess with God's arrangement for things. And marriage is an arrangement from God. And when people elevate it to a level that it's not supposed to be elevated to and make it a holier-than-thou position, then people are going to be striving for that position because they are convinced falsely that that will give them an elevated status before God. Sad and sad and so all kind of problems, we'll be talking about that in, in a week or so, the internal problems, and there end up being a division until you've got the Greek Orthodox Church and the Roman Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. Here's people that speak Greek now. They do not use instrumental music in worship. Why is that? Because they speak Greek. And they know what solo means. And it doesn't mean to play instrumental music in worship. That's all. The Inquisition expand upon your power base and ability to, to convert by killing Muslims. The Inquisition. And here's one of the things that really brought it about: translating the Bible in the language of the common man. In my files, I've got a, an article written by a priest in the 1800s who said, the most problem we've ever had is caused by the Bible. And that's, that's the case. And then when you've got the Bible translated into the common language of the people, and then you have a printing press that can make that widely available, then you have deceived then to overcome such things as the apostate church. Now, here's some... Some people that you maybe have not heard of, but here are important people in history 
who were serious enough about their desire to do what they were convinced was right that they stood in opposition to Roman Catholicism and some of the things they did. These individuals list, uh, existed for less than 100 years because of their persecution, but because they were so humble in their approach to things and because they were not bowed down to any such materialism that was so existing in Roman Catholicism, then that caught people's attention. It caught their attention to the point where here they have the Bible and they can read it and they look at these individuals and they look at how they look at these individuals and look at what the Bible says about what a real Christian is and they say they look more like a real Christian than does this that we're used to. And that was a proper way to view the situation. And of course, when you say that the Catholic Church is corrupt from the bottom to the top, then they might not look on you very favorable. But they were able to grow to the extent that because they became so popular, then the Pope, a Pope with all the idea of having a name like Innocent, misnamed for sure, Innocent III, made sure that that apostasy was squelched by killing at least 600,000 and possibly on up to a million of these people, courageous, in trying to do the right thing. Now, there are, some, there are some real heroes right there. Were they Christian? No. But they knew that what they were a part of was not Christianity in Roman Catholicism, for sure. Another fellow, his name was Peter Waldo. Sometimes you'll see his last name starting with a V. But this man was a successful businessman, and it just so happened that when <clears throat> his king came back with the new views of things that he had heard while he was away, then when Peter began to read about those things, then he was convinced that this was the truth. And so he quit his business, sold his business, gave his wife the opportunity to have his property, and he began to dispense with all the things that he had acquired through his successful business ventures to those that were in need. Well, obviously. Some followed him then for the loaves and the fishes, just like they did Jesus. But others, they saw the corruption of Roman Catholicism, and they were hearing this man preach the gospel right out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he did not have any training in some seminary somewhere. And so he began to grow, and his followers began to grow too. People would rather hear somebody preach the Bible then stand up and say the same thing week after week in a language they could not understand. Reckon why they would want to have that type of thing happen. Well, of course, as often is the case, they began to call themselves, after he died, Walter Neve. And, of course, they ended up being excommunicated by the church, and some of them even were put to death in various instances. John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was one of the first ones who opposed papal authority. That simply means the Pope's authority. And he is one of the first ones to translate the Bible into his own native tongue. And obviously, by putting the Bible in the hands of the people, since the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke chapter 8, verse 11, then those who want to keep the Bible hid from you don't like that at all, but John Wycliffe did it anyway. John Huss. He was influenced by John Wycliffe. When King Richard of England married Anne of Bohemia, they came back to Bohemia and they brought back the ideas of John Wycliffe. And it was based upon those ideas then that John Huss said, just as Wycliffe has turned people's heads around in England, I am going to change the people here in Bohemia. So you've got individuals, courageous individuals. I mean, here are people who know what happened when you stand opposed to Roman Catholicism. You don't live very long. Nowadays, if a person thinks they're going to have to not be able to hunt on Sunday morning, that's too much of a, of a problem to even consider becoming a Christian. Or somebody's going to have family members that make fun of them, or somebody at work will jeer and call them names. These people did what they did knowing, knowing that they were, in fact, 
drawing an X on their back. It saved you genius. Why did they do that? Because they were convinced that what they saw in Roman Catholicism was wrong and what they were attempting to do was right. you got to give it to them. They were courageous individuals. He, of course, was told to quit preaching. He didn't quit preaching. And so he ended. Now, here's the sad thing about old John Hudson. While he rejected Roman Catholicism in its entirety, he said that there wasn't any reason to follow anything that Roman Catholicism came up with unless you could find it in the Word of God. He was commanded by the king and by the emperor, too, to quit preaching, but he kept on preaching. Well, then they started trying to get him, started trying to get him to entice him to come to Rome. And lo and behold, they tried on one occasion. He was gone. They stole all his books, stole all his manuscripts. And then the emperor, a man by the name of Sigismond, he promised that he'd have safe passage. He could go and sit down with the Pope and the Pope's authority, and they would talk about this matter, and he would be given an opportunity in the room of the Pope to defend his actions. You know what, folks? I'd go. Maybe thoughtfully, but the possibility out there, just a little bit of a possibility, if you can get this guy to see the error of his way, then it will have a trickle-down effect that will be monumental. And so he went. But, of course, it was a sham. It was a sham. He was condemned as a heretic. He was given an opportunity to recant. He refused to do it. And so they burned him at the stake. What did he do? He said, the Pope is not God. That's it. You remember back in Amos chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, Amos was prophesying concerning the certain destruction that is going to come on the nation of Israel. It's going to come on them by the hand of the Assyrians. And the point that he's making here is that there is going to be no escape, and while they think everything's going to be fine and dandy, it's not. And here's how he describes it. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? In other words, they thought if you hear the day of the Lord, man, that's good. That's something that's going to be amazing. That's something I want to participate in for sure because the day of the Lord for a child of God has always been a wonderful occasion. Not now. How's it going to be? Well, the day of the Lord, instead of light, it's going to be darkness. And it's going to be like a man who is trying to run away from a lion and he runs right into the midst of a big old bear hug by a bear, and then he escapes from that bear, and he ends up going to his house and breathing heavily and leans over against the wall, and a snake bites. He can't get away. He's caught either way. Now, it's by his own choices, for sure, that he gets himself in a predicament like that anyhow, but friends, that aptly and accurately describes what ended up happening with all of these reformers. They went from one extreme to the other. In standing opposed to Roman Catholicism, they were absolutely right. But instead of coming to the truth and taking their stand in the truth, they went to the other extreme, threw out obedience to the gospel, made salvation a matter of faith only, taught Calvinism as John did, John Calvin did, and instead of it being falsely the church that decides whether you're saved or whether you're lost, Calvin said, no, God has already decided that before he even created the world. And if you're a part of the saved, you can't be lost, and if you're a part of the lost, you can't be saved. In each and every instance, what ended up happening was that instead of one apostate church, now there is an apostate church and a bunch of little 
counterfeit churches. And we'll have to follow that up, the Lord willing, the next time we have the opportunity. I'm convinced <clears throat> that people who are wise will learn the lessons of history. And of course, people that are not wise, they ain't no telling what they'll do. But when we see what happened in times past, the consequences and decisions that people make of failure to prize the truth of Almighty God, a desire to go along to get along, all those things, constantly we have to be aware of the way that we can be influenced in the world in which we live and even be influenced by others that we think that we can place confidence in. That wasn't the way it was in it. And we have to. We simply must learn those lessons of history. It may be that there are those in our audience this morning who've never obeyed the gospel, never been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, our question is simply this. Why have you? Remember on the road back to Ethiopia, there was a nobleman who had been to Jerusalem to worship. God sent a prophet, a preacher by the name of Philip, to preach to that old boy. And on that journey back, that Ethiopian said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? You see, there was something that was hindering him. There was something that stood between him and being a proper candidate so that he might be baptized. What was it? Well, Philip said, Well, if you believe with all your heart, you can. And that, of course, is when the Ethiopian said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And since that day, everyone has had obstacles that stood between them and obeying the gospel. Some, it's not believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a big obstacle. You know, there are sometimes people who, because of pressure, they'll want to be baptized. And even on one occasion, there was an individual who came forward, a good buddy of mine was preaching, guy yeah, came forward. Everybody in the audience was thankful this young man come forward, wanted to be baptized. He said, I want you to stand before this audience and make a good confession here in a minute. He said, what? He said, I want you to tell this audience, you know, that I believe that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He said, oh, I don't believe that. So what would you do? Would you go ahead and baptize him anyway? Don't think so. Why not? Because believing and confessing comes before baptism. Right there with repentance. And so it would have been useless to baptize that individual. A person has to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, or he cannot be scripturally baptized. One occasion, there's a fellow that wanted to be baptized. He was living in adultery. And he said, you mean to tell me that I've got to choose between the Lord and her? He knew this is exactly what he had to do. He said, well, right now, I'm choosing her. Her mom and daddy jumped all over me because they didn't baptize I said, listen, he made the choice. He knew what the choice was. And they said, well, I know one thing. If he's not baptized, he's lost. I said, that's right. But if he don't repent, he's lost too. Therefore, it would be ridiculous for me to baptize him. He won't repent. Friends, it's not really that hard. I understand. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to repent of your sins, then what would hinder you from making the confession that the eunuch did? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you do that, then you can be a Christian. You can be baptized into Christ. And the Lord will at the same time add you to His church. If you've not done that, the wise thing, the smart thing, the intelligent thing, the courageous thing is to do that. And if you've wandered away, be a man, be a woman in return. Even right now, while we're standing, while we're standing.